All right. Hello, Condig. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your comfort with your neighbors. We've got a packed house today, which is great given the weather. Uh, but this is the February uh, 2024 CentralOhio.net Developer Group uh, meeting featuring Drake talking about rest done right. I think my, my placeholder title for you was how not to suck at doing rest or something like that. That's but, about uh, right. Yeah. Um, so if you're here in the, in, the, in the office, we do have uh, guest Wi-Fi from improving, so thanks for improving, but please Wi-Fi responsibly. Don't be downloading Quake or whatever you want to do in there. Uh, Drake has asked, yes, you, you can use the internet if you need to to demonstrate uh, web requests. Perfect. Yes, that's okay. Um, if you're not familiar with us, uh, you can find us on Meetup at uh, well centralohio.net. We'll redirect you to our Meetup site, which is nice. Um, please join that group and you'll be able to find out about our next events. Uh, we generally announce them at least two weeks in advance is our hope, but you know, it, it's a little bit more like guidelines for us. Uh, us would be, oh, and uh, yes, we meet the fourth Thursday, January to October. Uh, don't get as good results the fourth Thursday of November or the fourth Thursday of December for some reason. So uh, we get about 10 meetings a year and they're all fun. Um, organizers are Alan, myself, and Sam, who is out tonight. Uh, if you want to join us, well, we, we, we are accepting uh, folks, so just chat with us and see how you want to help, and uh, we'll see where you fit. Uh, but this is our second meeting of the year. We're really excited about this one, Rest Done Right with Drake. Uh, we are still confirming our speakers for the next few months, but it looks like we'll have Mike Eaton next month talking about Spectre Console. Uh, Sam is probably going to be talking about uh, desktop app development, cross-platform desktop app development, which I'm really excited about because I'm rocking Linux now and I need something cross-platform beyond Windows uh, presentation framework. <laughs> um, and then we may have Burton uh, talking web components in May, but we are still looking for that. We do have a number of open slots, so if you have something you're interested in, in hearing about or something you're interested in talking about, talk to us about it. We'd love to get you scheduled in. Uh, we have a YouTube channel with a grand total of over 304 subscribers as of last night. So anybody want to guess the specific number of subscribers we have? 305. Yes, there we go. At least as of last night, 305. But I can marketing speak, say, over 304. Um, so you can find a whole lot of past uh, past videos of that. If you're ever feeling sick, you don't want to attend, uh, you didn't shower that week, uh, you can uh, you can find us on uh, the, the live stream or past recordings. What do you got? When do you get that YouTube plaque? <laughs> when we get the YouTube plaque. When do we get the YouTube plaque, Alan? Uh, I think we're off by a few tens of thousands. Uh, okay. Yeah. So so probably March. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, we are on Twitter, which is definitely not called X. Uh, we are Condig. We don't tweet a whole lot, but we do tweet about uh, important stuff. So give us a follow. Um, we also have a LinkedIn group that we really don't use very much. So if you want to start posting in there, that's cool. Um, we do generally auto-approve folks who have like a developer title. If you get a recruiter title or something, you're not getting in there. Just message me. We usually review the people who get flagged, but um, we, we are active there as well. Uh, our sponsors today are Improving, which you're all at Improving, so yay, good, good first step. Uh, so thanks Improving for the pizza, thanks for the space, and all that good stuff. Uh, JetBrains, we have a license to, to give away. And then .NET Foundation uh, will pay for our meetup fees, which is really nice. Uh, so we really like uh, all of that because we don't like having to pay for too much of this stuff while we do this. Uh, we also have an additional sponsor today who I didn't get on our slides, uh, but Pack Publishing has given me a copy of ASP.NET 8 Best Practices, uh, talking about web API development. Uh, the author for that is actually in the room. That would be uh, Jonathan uh, Danielko in the back there. Uh, I got it. I got to read this book. Uh, so uh, if you really want to, he can sign it and you can put some profanity on there if he's feeling feisty. Uh, but we will be uh, we'll be raffling that off at the end in addition to the JetBrains license that we're giving away. Uh, now time for more commercials. So we have other user groups in the area. Uh, Columbus JS is operating every first Wednesday. I apologize, I need to update the slide template to work on my new machine. Uh, the tech support user group uh, is not actually about IT tech support, it's about like the softer side of tech. It's a lot of fun. Uh, meets the what, second Wednesday or first Wednesday? It's the next one's the March 13th, I think. Uh, but it meets here. 
uh, CBUS Pass is a data SQL oriented group, uh, meets at IGS. I think it's the only one that doesn't meet here. Uh, and that's a good group. And then CBUS Azure. Drake, you want to talk about CBUS Azure? Yeah, so we're restarting the Azure group inside of Columbus. Um, I don't think we're actually consistent enough to say every fourth Wednesday. We are right. meeting next Wednesday. And then the week after that, there's actually a multi-cloud meetup with Azure, Terraform, and HashiCorp all there. Would recommend first week in March. So we're still settling what we we can we're doing we're taking suggestions if anybody has topics and wants to cover i know we're going to be doing some more ai some more policy as code some more terraform some more bicep mostly bicep i think i agreed <laughs> to give a talk there too so you avoid have. avoid that month whichever month yeah. it is <laughs> i have to talk later i can't remember what i told you i'd do <laughs> um but anybody like birthdays yeah. Okay, that's a strangely anti-birthday crowd, but we do have some approvals. Um, my favorite conference, or my favorite local conference anyway, is uh, Star Trek. They are turning 15 this year. Uh, May the 3rd is, is the event. It's, uh, it takes place at the AMC Easton. Uh, you get to go to the movie theaters, watch people talk, and then watch a showing afterwards of the latest movie. This year it's a little bit of a different movie. We'll talk about that in a second here. Um, but I mentioned this because A, some folks here are likely speaking there. The they'll find out in the next few days as we announce speakers and then B we have opportunities to buy tickets starting next week and they are cheapest if you buy them early uh, and then if your organization is looking to sponsor they have sponsorships open as well so stuff to be watching out for next week I think the 27th they open up their ticket sales I can't read my small print there okay um, the movie this time around I love this uh, <laughs> Speaking of birthdays, they are re-releasing The Phantom Menace. So they are, they're they re-airing The Phantom Menace, so I get to put my, my good old Star Wars memes on the slides again, and I'm very happy about that. So that's the movie this year. They had to move Deadpool 3 uh, to later in the year, and so uh, we're going with this. Uh, so it should be a lot of fun. So uh, transitioning a little bit, who is hiring right now? We are yeah, semi-hiring. We're, we're more of a wait list, but if you're if you're interested in in, in working with a, a leading edge, uh, chat with me. Just we might not get you in in the next month or so. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is like sort of hiring, but also it's weird. Mm -hmm. like and I have Alan, to wait a couple months, but they are interviewing. So it's a wait list thing. <laughs> Alan, same story. We're improving. Yeah, for right now. Okay. Yes. So there are some some possibilities if you want to chat with folks. Um, anybody looking? We'll chat with other folks. It's okay, right? Uh, it's a good good place to talk about that stuff. Uh, all that all the good stuff. Uh, so, house rules for improving: uh, keep the fires to a minimum. Um, feel free to get up and leave Drake and go get food and drink. I probably will. I yep. drink a lot, uh, so you know. And there's free diet Dr Pepper, so I'm I'm a happy man. Um, just uh, be quiet and respectful if you do so. Um, bathroom code. I think this is really only applicable for the ladies' room. Uh, I think the code is 5600 star. If it's not, it's written over there and over there. But it used to be 5600 uh, star. Uh, and then tonight's talk is Rest Done Right uh, by my friend Drake, who is hopefully going to do this right. Yeah, um, hopefully. But uh, <laughs> I will get out of your way and let you talk about your talk. And right. uh, we're grateful to have you. I have at least 50 50 odds of getting it right, I think. So we'll see what happens. Uh, you do it there. Now you can get some rest. Okay. I was debating if I should open with like a bad pun. Although if I do, I feel like it shouldn't be a rest pun. <laughs> it's sort of expected though, right? Well no, I think I should do a totally off topic pun. I think it's funnier. Um why do pirates spend so long going through the alphabet? R. Because they spend years at sea. <laughs> so let's get into the talk. Um, I like interactive presentations. I like talking to you all, ask questions during. I will have at least one interactive activity where I will not move until you guys participate. So good luck. Um, yeah, and this is going to be covering rest. I originally thought this talk was really basic when I first gave it a couple, at this point a couple of years ago. Um, and then recently I've been on a number of projects where apparently the architects needed to hear this talk. So not as basic as I thought. Um, if you want to hear having me munching companies later, just ask afterwards. 
Okay, so I'm an associate cloud consultant at Adesic. That means that I do full stack applications, whatever language the customer asks for, although usually .NET and React. Um, I'm modernizing things, improving them, so doing a lot of conversions, a lot of improvements. And then I really like teaching and talking and learning. I talk a lot. Anybody who has met me knows this. Um, so yeah. So this presentation exists because APIs are one of the core backbones of the internet. Client and server is everywhere now. Every website you go to pretty much is calling a server, interacting with it, and also has a client-facing website that communicates through APIs. And .NET user group, Microsoft is really big on Rust. Um, it is very is one of the most common uses of .NET APIs. And then, of course, part of this is also just to generally define terms and make sure that we're all on the same page with what things mean because one of the hardest parts of software is when the people you're talking to think the words you're saying mean something else. Uh, yeah, every technical problem is a business problem first, whether you like it or not. Um, and then we're gonna do a small demo setting up some APIs in .NET so you see how it's done. So APIs, application program interface, this is the call that goes from, I don't know, Facebook to their servers to say, can you log in? What photos are there? Who are your friends? It transfers data back and forth and allows communication between machines. Pretty simple. Um, so anything on the, on the internet, you're doing API calls. And REST in particular is an API architectural style. It is a way of laying out APIs in a clear and consistent pattern. So they're well organized, so they're easy to maintain and improve over time. And it's structured mostly around verbs. Get, post, put, delete, etc., as well as HTTP codes. And it's everywhere. So the goal of REST is the same goal as everything else, which is profit. Um, they want to make uh, better apps. They want to be more performant, so go faster. Wants to be scalable, and it's easier to add more uh, APIs in the future. And of course, everything needs to be simple and modular, and then uh, just all the standard goals of a better language. You know, what's the story? You have like 15 different coding standards, so you're gonna make one that fixes all of it, so now you have 16 coding standards. <laughs> I'm not saying that's what happened to REST, but it's not far off, since there are a number of other API professional styles out there. And the way that REST aims to achieve those goals is through organization and structure. In the same way that you'd take a complicated, just if you had a giant inbox of random overflowing papers, it's a nightmare. If you, you, it's not scalable, it's not maintainable, it's kind of scary and you want to set it on fire and run away. Um, and how do you fix that? You make a filing cabinet. You actually find a structure so you know where everything goes, you know what things are called, how things are labeled. And that's kind of what this architectural style does. Is So you know where APIs are, and if you're opening up a given folder, what should the APIs in there do? Um, these are the core constraints of REST. So these are what make a RESTful API. As a client server architecture, it is stateless. It has a uniform interface. Those are the verbs. Those are the HTTP codes. It is a layered system. We'll go to more on that later. And then cacheability and code on demand, which these are not really as common anymore. And I'm just going to skip them because they're complicated. Never actually used them myself. Although I will cover HADOS, which is also not as common, but slightly more so. Um, so first two constraints of REST. First one, really simple, client server architecture. That means there is a front-end app and a back-end app, or something similar, and they interact back and forth just through REST. It is a loose coupling. If you have ever worked with a Visual Basic app with, let's say, uh, WebSockets and some like back-end app where they're actually closely connected, that is not this. This is two separate apps calling back and forth. Real simple. This is the standard of the internet now. It's the water we swim in, so you don't even notice it. And then stateless, when you're calling um, RESTful APIs, each call stands on its own individually, does not keep track of where you are over time. Um, this has some benefits. This has some downsides. That's a more complicated question, but you can't ask questions about it if you'd like. Pretty much it. It also relates dependency injection, 
also a slight side tangent we're going to do if you want. So next one, the uniform verbs. This is, if somebody thinks of rest, this is what they think of. Get, put, post, de uh, delete. I think I've said them, those in a different order every time I mentioned them so far. I don't know how I'm doing this. Maybe get it right once. So get gets data, retrieves things, post, creates something new, um, put, updates something, <coughs> or runs a more complicated program, and then delete deletes data. It's pretty clear. This is the kind of thing of defining terms. So if somebody sees, oh, there is a get API, what does it do? It's obvious. Um, and there are a lot of other verbs also. They are not that well used. Um, and sometimes some browsers don't even support them at all. Um, but know that they are out there, things like head, trace, options, connect, patch. If you want to know more, uh, Google and ChatGPT are your friends. I don't think I could even name what half them do without reading on the slide. Another big factor is the one, one differentiator between the verbs, especially post and put, is the item potency of the action. So item potency is a very fancy term, which means that if you do something if you do the same thing multiple times, you get the same result. That makes something item potent. So this is kind of different between something like post and put. So let's say you wanted to make Matt a team lead for some reason. I would do it. I would. It's in the slides. It's not me. I didn't make this. Um, that was way funnier in my head. <laughs> so let's say we're doing a post. Post is not item potent. If we post to add Matt three times, he's in the list three times. So he has three different Matt's as team leads. Too much Matt. That's a problem. If we do a put and we run it three times to replace team lead one with Matt to update it, we run that three times, it always gets the same result. You're just overwriting the same thing over and over. The same thing with delete. So if we delete Matt from the list of team leads, thank goodness, we delete him again, and again, nothing actually happens. He just stays deleted. So that's item potency. It will come up a lot in this. So I put a slide on it. Any questions about that? People get mixed up on it sometimes. Nope. Sweet. Super easy. Okay. Status codes. You have all seen this. I assume everybody's favorite status code is, uh, what is it? 417? 18? 18. 18. Which is, I'm a little teapot. Very important. And anybody tech or regular student, you've heard this joke before. Um, but these are status codes telling you what the result of a given rest call is. So a 404 or not found means you can't find a record. Um, a 200 is success. If you want to memorize them, I recommend animal themed flashcards. These are very common. They are great. So yes, I'm a teapot, most important code. But there's a variety of them, not authorized, um, not, uh, not authenticated, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Um, paid off. This is another factor of REST that is, so REST was originally a white paper about a theoretical structure for APIs. Um, not all the parts of it are still followed. This is one that gets ignored in a lot, but it is relevant, so I'll cover it briefly. So paid off, which is Hypermedia the engine of application state, is essentially an instruction manual for your computer to say, if you make this call, what other calls are available that are related to it? So and it allows you to theoretically hit a random API endpoint on the internet and walk through other steps to see what all else is available. In theory, if somebody does all the work to document their code that they're yeah, that's that's important. Yes. Because last week I got I got burned by somebody who had implemented Kados to page their data and, and their they missed some of their stuff. <laughs> the documentation didn't mention it was paged at all. Yep. Yeah, it's great. No, it's a uh, it's a whole thing. But an example of what this looks like in practice is let's say we were getting information on a bank account. So bank.example.com, my favorite bank, all my money's there, all $3. Um, and I got the amount for my balance. If my balance has $100 in it, I can see, oh, I could deposit, I can withdraw, I can transfer, I can close my bank account, et cetera, et cetera, all these options. If I have negative $25, <coughs> because I spent it all on Pal World, um, <laughs> then the only option I have is to deposit more money. The bank will not let me close my account until they get their cash. <laughs> Makes sense? So this is kind of, you're making a call, and in that call you see, here are related links you could also go through. And in theory, 
you could train an AI to actually navigate all the way through an API based off this. <laughs> the AI expert is shaking his head in pain, but it's possible. Do, do you want your AI automatically following a delete link and closing your bank account? Is it possible? <laughs> He's not saying no. So it's possible. You can all train your AI to do this. Should you? No. But could you? Yes. Very important. The next part of REST, this is one of the really big keys, is REST is a layered system. It's hierarchical. What that means is that it goes from the overall API to an individual controller to an individual set, like verb, so like get, put, post, delete, two methods. This is the ex going back to that filing cabinet. I know that this filing cabinet is tax forms, this filing cabinet is insurance claims, this filing cabinet is birthday cards, and then inside of that I can see what year they're in. So if I'm looking for a birthday card from last year, I can go and find that easily. In the same way, REST makes it so that I know where a given type of API lives, where to find it, and where to put it when I make a new one. This is one of the most important parts when done correctly. Um, and I think a really easy way to compare this is or to explain this to give a comparison. So a SOAP API is flat. There is one controller, everything's in it. Good luck. Um, I am currently in the middle of a project with a federal contractor kind of thing. Um, they are converting a Visual Basic app from 2008. Um, to .NET Core in REST, from SOAP to REST. In theory, it's from SOAP to REST. They did not understand the URLs, and that was a whole fight with the festival URLs. They thought that if you use the verbs, it's REST, and you can ignore URLs. Fun story. Um, so I walk in, I'm like, okay, where are your APIs? Oh, here they are. It is 27 APIs plus 15 internal methods in an 8,000 line file. Good luck. Yeah, no, it, and now no file is over a thousand lines. It is much smaller. I still wish it wasn't a thousand lines, but their logic's a bit of a mess. It's fine. Everything's fine. Nothing's on fire. I get lots of sleep. <laughs> Just ask my husband how much sleep I get. Some. Um, so now, since that higher construction one of the most important parts, we're going to stop and we're going to do a break here and demo through it. So this is the interactive part that we will not move on until you guys succeed. <coughs> so you better win. Oh wait, that's the wrong button. I want uh, all... There we go. Okay, so we are building a social media for book readers. This doesn't exist. I don't know where you see the screenshot. Like, obviously, I made Goodreads from scratch yesterday. Yes. Um, and we need to make some various APIs to support this. I don't know. I want to add books add readers, add reviews, etc. So here we go. Here are the various controllers that I have. So we have a controller for readers, controller for books, controller for reviews, and a controller for comments. So these are so you know where things go. And we have a list of our various collections and value objects as well as REST verbs. What does this mean? A RESTful URL starts with like the overall store.com slash and then goes through collections and value objects. So I will do one example first. Um, a user is clicking on a book and wants to see all of its reviews. So I'm going to put this in the, um, I'm going to put it in the reviews full controller. Some of this is ambiguous. This could maybe go in the books controller instead. I'll put it in the reviews controller. So this is, I want to see all of them, so it is a get. I am getting back data, very simple. And if I can, my drag works, perfect. Oh, oops. I, like I said, I get lots of sleep. Where'd you get that idea? <laughs> yeah, that am gonna delete all the bad reviews, exactly. So, so I am, so I'm starting off with, oh, I want to see all the reviews within a book. So first we're starting off with the books. So we're going through all the books and finding one individual book. So inside of the collections books, the collection books, we are finding the value object book ID. 
So we are finding one specific book. And on that, we are finding all of the reviews. If I wanted to get one specific review, it would be review slash review ID. And if I wanted to add or delete a review, or if I wanted to add a review, if I wanted to get all the reviews, those are all under this same URL. Does that make sense? Yes. Can you try to zoom in a little bit? Oh. Yeah, I can, I can zoom in a little bit more. How about right. that? Okay. Actually, oh, I forgot the whole screen button. Yeah. Okay. A little better? Okay. Perfect. First victim. Pick which use case you're going to solve. And we're staying here until you guys solve all of them, just so you're aware. We don't have to solve them well, though, right? Oh, yeah. I didn't say solve them right. Probably a way to watch the combat on a reveal they found well with them. Okay. Where should that be? That should probably be the you know, comments uh, for the controls. It's not for focusing on the comments. Okay. And do you want to finish out the whole rest of it? Or do you want to let somebody else do the next part? Uh, I think we're going to need a gap. So unless it's uh, we're uh, uh, wanting to weed. Uh, 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 well, if they're, they're adding a comment. Oh, oh yeah. Well, okay, so they'll probably be a post. But then we also probably need a as well if we wanted to update it, so I would suppose. Yep, yeah, but this is just, I'm, I'm trying to make them a small user story, so this is just to add a new one. Okay, um, and what would be the URL? How would you find this given review, or this given comment? Okay, reviews, review ID. See, that's where it gets debatable, mm -hmm. because you could do reviews slash review ID, slash comment, or you could do book slash book ID slash review slash review ID slash comment. Or you could do both. Or you could do yeah. both. You could do more. Probably you could do just slash comments <laughs> if you want to ignore all yeah. the value of rest. But it sounded like uh, first one I heard was book slash book ID slash review slash review ID. Man, you give me the long one to do. Okay, I'm going to see if I can get any faster over time. Book slash book ID. And I imagine these are all perfectly aligned. <laughs> there we go. I think it even has auto like snap align. I still can't do it. Um, so yeah, so it's saying for this given book, for this given review, add a comment. That makes it very clear. What would decide how you're doing this? Maybe what your IDs are. If every review ID starts at one for a given book and every book, so there can be duplicate IDs, then you need to do this all the way. If every review has a unique ID, you could do just review slash review ID slash comment. Okay, who wants the next one? Anybody who spoke, you're out. Well, the IDs, the IDs clearly have to be goods. <laughs> yeah, I would hope so. Um, I'm currently dealing with a cycle number for uh, cancer treatments. It goes one to three every time. I, I can top that. <laughs> Azure Machine Learning uses IDs of st uh, the strings such as whittling dash squirrel. That's their ID. It's just yeah. It's, 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 I'm gonna move on. Okay, next victim. Somebody from the audience who hasn't talked yet. I'll start calling names if I remember anybody's name. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> okay, I'll just start calling out titles. Tech elevator student, Tiana? What? Was that close? Yeah, it was very close. Yes. Very close. So close that it's spot on. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, which one do you want? Um, a user wants to see all of the books on a reader's bookshelf. Okay. That's what I've got. Jeffrey, Jeffrey approved. Let's go ahead and let's put this in the... Uh, so is it in the re reader's controller or books controller? I heard reader's controller. It's, here's the thing, it's a little debatable. Sometimes like some people would never even make a comments controller at all. Because oh, it's just like two API calls, let's just skip it. Is it a get or something? Okay, somebody said a get, and now if you want to get all the current data, that sounds reasonable enough. And then what's the URL? Uh, 
can have readers next. Yep, readers next. Yep. Yep, exactly. You guys are already outperforming an architect from IBM. Um, oh, shoot, I didn't mention the company. How'd that happen? Okay, who's up next? A shocking number of people will say just be, just say what people would have said like, that you'll see in the real world. What, what's, a, what's a bad example here? Get all books. That's the URL. <laughs> that's not a joke. <laughs> and then that's bad. Why? Um, because it doesn't even tell you what you're getting books by. And it's also inconsistent. And every single one gets their own name and their own URL. So all of a sudden, you have four different, like literally, the current app I'm working on, has three different get uh, recipients uh, APIs because they didn't like communicate that we have three APIs that return the same object. Because they're all different names. So they're different, right? This way, it's a lot harder to mess it up. Even if they ended up being in either controller, it's going to have the same URL or pretty similar. So, next victim. You got two left. All right, let's do a reader wants to change the email address. Do uh, reader's controller. Okay. Uh, readers, reader ID. If I can do this right. It's gonna be a put. All my books. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> <Go home. laughs> no. It's a put. It's a put, guys. It's a put. Please. No, I like put. I don't like having seven API calls to do one thing. How about, yeah, uh, that's it. Uh, well, I guess the question is, would it be possibly a patch since it's uh, only, only changing the email one and you're not uh, changing everything? Yeah. Yes. So that is where the kind of more specific, particular verbs get into play. Um, the truth of the matter is, though, most people won't use the most correct verb. They will use the one of these four verbs that is closest. <laughs> Um, which is why we get to restful, which is coming up next. Because yes, no, Apache is more correct for this. Next slide will cover this. What is the name of this talk again? Uh, rest done right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's okay. I was a mechanical engineer first. You know what that means? That means that you round, and it's correct enough. So right, right ish. Yes. Oh, okay. Right ish. Yeah. It's it's done. It's done right Second to edition. industry standards. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. So, but the thing is, and it's debatable again because you some people do it as a push, people do it as a patch, or even a few of the other verbs, and they're all correct. Ish. This will come up later. Okay. Last one. Who wants it? Admins want to delete a specific content mm -hmm. due to swearing. They're just trashing the book. Let's be real. Okay. Uh, go ahead and show that in the comment controller. Okay. Uh, I'm going to put it. There's not a lot of space yeah. here. I'm just going to pretend it's in the comments controller right there. Sure, sure. Sounds good. Uh, let's go ahead and put a delete verb on it. Yep. Uh, and then. We've already set the standard. <laughs> <laughs> you have all of okay. And there comes cheating. And then throw a comment ID on there. I can almost use uh, my own tool, I promise. Okay. Okay. So that is kind of how these overall URLs work. You can see how it is a story, it is a sentence, it is providing clarity, it is providing readability, you know where things are, roughly. If you don't know exactly where they are, you at least know the two or three places to look. And then the next fun thing with it is that you can read URLs when you don't know, you've never seen it before. So 
Last question, um, somebody wants to change an API because right now um, the book reviews are displayed in order posted, but they want to see them in terms of most likes, most relevant review first. What API on this list would you change in order to see, to change that feature? You have 20 seconds before I pick an audience member. Okay. I think it's the, the get store.com slash book slash book ID slash reviews. Yep. So once again, the question is, right now book reviews are displayed by order posted. Readers want to see the most uh, relevant reviews first. So he is saying under here, get store.com slash book slash book ID slash reviews. So this is getting um, the list of reviews for a book and you want to change the order that the list comes back in. You might actually want to sort this in the front end, not the back end, but it's fine. This happens sometimes. But yeah, so you see that by knowing how REST works, you can read this list of URLs without even seeing the names of the, um, the APIs and know roughly, have a good idea for what it means. That is the benefit of using REST properly or properly enough. Which brings us to the next slide. You survived the demo. Um, there we go. <coughs> so, next slide. Are the laws of rest absolute? No. Because if you ever look around, you see RESTful APIs, right? Like, what does it mean if something is, like, I don't know, what's a good example of this? Trying to think of another adjective ending full. Yeah, if you, I don't know, like, but RESTful doesn't mean that you're entirely, like, rest. You're not all the way there. You're just, like, in that direction. If you're careful, you're not, like, incredibly cautious and, like, always absolutely doing everything the most safe way possible. It's like, oh no, you're like taking more care. You're a little full of it. You're not all the way there. Um, and with REST, there are apps that are mostly REST, but not all the way there, some more than others. There are some rules that you just, that if you're not doing them, this is definitely not REST. There are some that everybody breaks. I don't know the last application I've seen that uses HADOS, for example. Um, and then also there's some cases where REST just isn't the best split and you have to bend the rules a little bit to make things work. So here is an example of kind of some of those differences. So using HADOS or caching properly, those are pretty much everybody breaks those rules, for being honest. Any RESTful API you see out there is likely to not use HADOS. It's unlikely to be cached properly, even if they know a little bit about Redis. Um, and then another common one would be using actions as API calls. This one is a worse offense than just not using HADOS. And people will, instead of saying, like a post for example.com slash user slash ID slash roles, they will say user ID add role. That is a worse offense than just avoiding HADOS. But people will have this and call this REST because it says post, so that means it's rest. Because um, one of the hard things with it is none of these verbs actually have that many restrictions on them. You can write a get, and in the body, like you can write a get in .NET, and in that get, it deletes all the data. And it will show up in your swagger as a get. It'll show up in your postman as a get. It is not a strictly typed architecture. So just be aware, sometimes people use these wrong. In that case, that's essentially not REST anymore if you're just not even using the words right. Um, but if somebody's just missing one or two of the more obscure parts, that's fine. Um, another big one is either potency or people using, yep, post versus patch versus put. A lot of people will just call everything a post or everything a put and just kind of forget about it. Um, or they will use, uh, put and not have the item potent or vice versa. And then of course people often avoiding patch and not using it even though it is more correct. And this is a thing, it's kind of like English. 
Um, let's see. Um, wow, now I'm forgetting all my English. Uh, this is really embarrassing. I'm trying to think of a, an example in English. Oh, who is that for? Or like, instead of whom is that for? Whom is technically correct, but if I say who is that for, you still understand what I'm saying. That's still English. That is still correcting up the function. So if I use post instead of put, that is like saying who instead of whom. Um, it is like saying irregardless or literally. <laughs> Some of those are worse than others. <laughs> Some of those are better. But there are lines of how correctly and incorrectly everybody speaks. But there is also a line at which that's not English anymore. Those are just made up things. Um, I'm looking at the Zoomers in the audience. When, when, when this all became a thing that we did instead of so, one of the things I saw a lot of was everybody just did post all the time for everything, yeah. including for gets. Yep, because one of the things you run into is if you're doing a get, um, gets don't allow you to include a body in .NET. So if your get is a really complicated request and it has like 10 query parameters and you want to search things, just do a post because then you can include a body. They, they do a post to get all the users I don't like. like yep. That, right? Should you do that? Is that correct? No, but people are working around some of the rules of the framework that are not always that effective. Which, it's a whole mess. Which is the reason why that rests in those issues. Because people don't all agree on what something should be. So it is very useful to the degree that we all agree on what things mean. Um, it's not useful when it's not. When the, dress, when the dress is blue and silver, what are the blue and gold, black and silver? Well, I'm really. It's, it's been a few years. It's been a few years. What's, what's the dress color? Somebody shout it out. You know what I'm talking about? White and gold. Or white and gold, yeah. When the dress is white and gold, <laughs> white and gold apparently don't mean the same thing for all of us. All of a sudden, it's not useful anymore. We're just confusing each other. When this table is tan, that is useful. We're all seeing the same thing. So making sure that the team all understands what rest means, that you're using it properly, or at least close enough, um, to overcome that. Lack of state can sometimes be an issue. Some applications function better with knowing what previous calls were. It reduces complexity. Another big one is that REST doesn't have that many verbs. Even if you use all of them, there's not that many options, and not all of them is supported by all browsers. Sometimes they're just not a good uh, verb for something. Another big one, and actually part of that is that you can also have issues with complexity because of that, where let's say we want to uh, get if a specific user can add uh, a, cancer, um, a cancer screening. There's not necessarily a good verb for that always, like get kind of works, but it's a subcategory of a person, not the whole thing. There's really not a way to do that. Well, I'll just get the user and return all these extra rows of data, which is more information, or something like um, uh, GQL can return just one field. So there's some issues with complexity there as well that you run into with REST where you're returning too much or too little data, and that's why people end up doing things like using just a verb name at the end instead. And then the other final one is just like any framework, any more complicated system, it takes more work to set up. If you're putting, if you have three pieces of paper, why would you build a whole filing cabinet? You wouldn't, set them on your table. If you have a SOAP API that only has two API calls, that's fine. When you hit 27, get a filing cabinet or get out of town. Okay, and that is essentially it for the me just lecturing at you side. See so so me badly write code and make lots of typos. Any questions, comments, concerns? Other than the thing you talked about so far, mm -hmm. what do you see done wrong the most? Um, I mean, really the most common one is bad URLs. Like, is a big one Yeah, and no, no, that, 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 that's really the most common one I've seen is just really bad URLs or also um, people trying to do like slash and then like say a whole method name in there or also people trying to like mix in other words. Like if you're going to have a method that gets recipients, 
please actually name the API call, just like get recipients by ID. Don't call it like retrieve recipients and things like that. So people kind of move doing other things around it to get more complicated, um, as well as some like messes with query parameters and how what are and aren't, aren't required. That can also become a bit of a <coughs> mess if done poorly. But what, what advice would you have for specifically like building APIs in ASP.NET? Um, set up Swagger early and just kind of use that to verify. So I'll show it later, but Swagger's a great tool that actually will chunk your APIs under controllers and show you all the information about them and just using tools like that so you see all of your APIs. So kind of the before you dive in to add a new thing, look at what all is there is kind of one of the really big steps instead of just wandering off on your own, architect a little bit. I'm sure this is covered, but when is the appropriate time to use query string, request body, or HTTP headers? That is a good question that I did not cover. Um, Talk about yeah. request body a little bit. Yeah, I did a little bit, because some of the calls do and don't have <coughs> request bodies. So something like a query string is actually inside the URL, for something like a get, you can't use request bodies at all. So it's going to be just query strings or headers. Um, headers are very commonly used for things that are shared across all the APIs. So let's say um, the user ID is part of your logs and it's passed in for every API. Then that's probably a header. Same for anything to do with authentication. So usually your JWT key tokens are passed in as headers. Um, Let's see what else. I've also seen things like trace IDs or kind of other generated stuff managed there as well. A trace ID is very useful for a multi-level application because at each, if, let's say your application is passing through five microservices, you can have one trace ID. So when searching logs, you can see where did this one call go. That kind of thing is very frequently passed in headers. Bodies are usually, um, if you're, uh, if you're, adding data, like the entirety of the class or the entirety of the updated class is a fairly common thing to include in the body. Although, once again, people mess with it sometimes. Sometimes they'll, like, uh, if you need to do something that's a more complicated action, that will often be actually a body of a post request, or one of the fields in the body would be something like action type. That could also be done as a query string. That's really just a personal preference question where I would say try to match the rest of the application as much as possible. That answer it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, client generated unique IDs or server side generated in the response menu? Is, is there a Or uh, I don't know gonna, enough. If to, you're going to post an object, yeah. do you rely on the client to generate the unique ID? Or do you rely on the server to generate the unique ID? I always generate the unique ID on the server side, but I don't know enough to like give a definitive comment. But generally, what I've seen is a post is you would post something like um, uh, users use ID roles. You would post that, and the res and the return body contains the new ID generated on the server, and then you know you jump to the new page based on that ID is the pattern I've seen most often. I don't know enough to say definitively, although people in the audience that have more experience want to chime in. Do you want the server to generate yeah. most, almost all the time? Yeah. 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 Okay. If it's something like a blog on the user, then you can't find site is fine or fine ish. But yeah. Trust the server. Yeah, what if you have two clients that make the same one? Yeah. Mm, yeah. The, the second one fails. <coughs> or they over it. Okay. More questions. I'm being last, bullied. Last one. Uh, I'm, I'm generally curious, like yeah. what everybody here thinks. But this one's getting yeah. Into, into this uh, heterogeneous uh, response objects or homogenous. Meaning, do you send different response data structures based on the status code, or do you have a uniform response object that has optional sub structures within it? What I've seen for uh, that kind of works well is having at least a couple of uniform fields. So I am guaranteed to get, let's say, a return code and description, something like that that I can query off of. Um, and then other parts will vary because, I mean, if you're adding a recipient versus you're adding a, a, a provider, those are going to be different um, usually. 
the, the issue they run into with a totally uniform uh, response body is you just run into bloat, where you're returning so much data every time. But there, but there still is like a benefit to saying, hey, we know that every application in this code it returns a response code. Zero is success. Negative one is a server failure. Negative ten is a uh, not found. Well, that probably should be a four hundred four kind of thing. Some of those you can have happen. Although those can also be redundant with the HTTP status codes. So that's part of the answer as well. Is that a few of those across everything fields come back as headers or come back as status codes, depending on the application, the architecture, and the how much thought was put into this before they started, and they didn't just kind of tack on things halfway through. One way of creating a module so it can really put you off. There's yeah. the, the RP GAR system of dual zero API, and that's the way that they return. Yeah. Yes. There's process well, so three of them now, but it has a couple unique, and then there's a data section. Yeah. And if you bring for an employee, it wants that <coughs> on just because of what you bring data to all the system. Yeah. And then, like, the most common version of that, like you're saying, is so you, uh, wrapper that's always there would be the HTTP status code, which is why if you run into an application where when it can't find a response, it just throws an exception, unnamed is an issue. But you don't really need the status code, because that's coming back with response. But there's probably like a sub-status. Yeah, there can be. turn over the application, like an error code. Yeah. That, like, it it gives you some better insight. Not everybody uses that darn status code right. I work with one of yeah. these now they give you 200 all the time, and the response is, oh, turn a server error. Yeah, no, that's the, oh, yeah, the, the current app I'm dealing with, it literally, it, half the APIs just always give a 200, and then it has an internal code for server error, not found, whatever. And then the other half, if they can't find it, just throw an exception with like an unnamed exception. So, but, but that was the old SOAP one. They just told us like, hey, you can just slap verbs on it becomes rest, right? And then we had a fight for two weeks. Um, other questions? I have a question online. They're not very sure exactly what they mean, but they asked if you could discuss update verifiability, please. Oh, that's probably on uh, if someone has, the two people trying to make the same post or, or quote something. Yeah. And you know, what happens when you win, right? So I think it's hard to patch on this. Yeah, it's almost like a kind of like a run race condition style thing. Yeah. Um, part of that is where you run into something like item potency, where if it, they're both updating the same thing, it won't be a big difference, but if you're both inserting, you'll end up with duplicates. I don't know too much more about how to respond to the question without more details. So, so use there is another demo. Last question. Does anybody about Mark have a question? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, one more time. What is Pramis R P A R A M S API calls and how do we define that? Oh, parameters. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And how do we define that? I know. Yeah. They usually come with URL, mm -hmm. but so what is um, PR parameters specifically, and how the machine goes to search that same thing? Um, so the parameters are essentially, if you think like a method call, you're passing a parameter. So like let's say we're having a method that get that's returns are multiplied by two is a method, very simple method. You pass in the parameter is the the number that you want to multiply by two. So in the same way, if I want to search for uh, book reviews, there could be a query parameter, which is number of stars. And if I pass in one, it will return only the one star reviews. If I pass in five, it will return only the five star reviews. So these are usually optional extra fields to get a more specific search or to control exactly how things are working. Um, because when you're passing in a get, you can't pass in any body. So that's you. Does that answer the question mostly? Yeah. Uh, okay. Another follow-up question. So if I wanted to search for the book, mm -hmm. and uh, potentially parameter could be number of stars. 
Yeah, how could I know it is the existence of private from who or like who is all that could be anything? So the way that you know that is good documentation, essentially. So uh, if you want an actual pretty good example of this, there's a D&D 5th edition API online um, that has documentation of all of the different calls and like what query parameters exist for it. We'll also be showing Swagger later, which when set up properly will by default show you all possible query parameters. Okay, so usually we do that first before I create that. Yeah, there's going to be some looking into documentation to see what's possible because if it's a black box, you have no idea, then you'd never know. And yeah. also could be a uh, misunderstanding, like what yes. says it's not perfect. Yeah. No, people never misunderstand code. It's all written perfectly and so clearly <laughs> that it's <laughs> nobody's ever misunderstood a single line of code. Okay, so we're running a little bit short on time for the demo, so I'm going to try to speed through it. Yeah, fine. Oh, we have time? I don't want to supposed to... As long as you finish within the next two hours, we're fine. Oh, great. Never mind. You guys are going to suffer. Okay. So I'm going to show you two ways how to build your first uh, API in .NET. Um, the first way is with Visual Studio. Uh, Visual Studio is great in some ways. It is built to support .NET. It has a lot of built-in things for you. It also costs money if you're going to use it as anything but a personal or learning project. So be warned, there are licensing requirements. You cannot use the community edition at work. So I'm going to build a new project. I'm going to find a template for a RESTful API. And I'm going to call it, uh, I don't know, this is a test. Great project name. <laughs> I'm gonna. I like HTTPS. I like OpenAI. OpenAI and Swagger are. Are they technically the same thing, or like essentially the same thing? They're 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 uh, tightly coupled. And .NET 8.0. And it is now creating a project for the benefit with uh, using Visual Studio. A lot of things are done for you. There's a lot more support. You benefit Visual Studio Code. It's open source. There's more flexibility, more extension in some ways. So it built this program with various setup pieces, as well as a first controller for weather forecast. I'm going to run it. And should have hit run and then started talking about what Visual Studio does. Um, so Visual Studio Code also has a lot of cool forks off of it because it is open source. If you're ever looking for some of the AI-based uh, code editors like Cursor.io or Google's new one, which is uh, Project uh, DX, Project, shoot, forget the name of it. Um, those are forked off Visual Studio. But okay, here we go. So that ran, this is Swagger, and I see a get weather forecast, so I assume that means I am getting weather forecast try it out because Swagger is very useful. It shows what you're going to expect to get and there are no parameters. I hit get and it gets weather forecast. I built an API. I'm done. Let's go home. <laughs> yeah, so that's the benefit of Visual Studio um, is it does a lot of the work for you. What's the problem with this? Uh, the first time I tried to write a .NET application entirely from scratch it took me two weeks to set up my uh, program.cs file because I'd never done it myself before. And I thought I knew how to because I'd worked with .NET files before. It turns out there's a lot of extra pieces in there that you don't know about until you do it. So let's do that. Let's actually build one from scratch from scratch. In, uh, let's kill that off. And let me pull up my notes. When I get stuck, I have to reference. Normally, I Google it, but I only have one small screen to look at. So you guys are going to get uh, printed notes that are literally just code snippets from my yeah. practice API. Okay. I don't feel old now. <laughs> I just hate trees. Have you been using Copilot or Cody with this? Yes. Like yeah. Yes, I use Copilot for everything. It's great. If you ever want, I have a separate presentations on Copilot. Okay, so here is .NET Meetup REST presentation. Great name. Very effective. Very powerful.
and I'm going to start a new .NET application. So, oh wait, oh, sorry. <coughs> Apparently my, okay, no, Copilot Labs. I still need to remove the extension for Copilot Labs. Okay, so how do you, can you guys see this in the back or not really? You may want to go with a light lead. Oh. I hate to say it. Really? No. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna try it for a second. I actually don't even know how to switch to light theme. Control shift P. Yeah, I guess that's fair. And then the, and then there you go, second one down. Oh. oh. Is that more readable? You can say oh I was hoping you'd say no. Okay. Okay. So .NET new web. .NET has a lot of different pre-built configurations. You can go to the website for documentation under .NET new, and it actually has one for MVC, which will build out an API for you, but new web is just a fairly empty uh, web project, so that's what I'm gonna do, build it as much from scratch as possible. So what does that mean? That means, let's see, .NET run, that I have essentially an empty hello world project. So that's all it does, is build an application and then run hello world. It is on, how do you read light mode? <laughs> oh, I wasn't ready, yeah, no, I'm, I'm burning. I need to turn down my brightness. Actually, I will do that, that's better. Um, okay, but yeah, that's how you'd run it. And I did not. Oh, that's why I switched to the wrong. Uh, there we go. So, Hello World app, that's what we're starting from. We're starting from the real basics. Now, let's get to it. So, I want to have a RESTful application. So that means that I want to have Swagger in it because that is very, very useful. You need to actually install an extension to this. Um, so you can do this by going to like a NuGet extension and doing it that way, or you can just type it yourself. I don't want to make any typos. There we go. And apparently I misplaced, okay. Apparently I should have numbered my pages. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily I happened to, ah, oh, there it is, okay. Done that package. Okay. So that is adding a package to my application. So if you ever want to see the packages that you're running, um, you can go under your um, .cs project fo uh, file and actually see a list of packages. Um, so that way, if you're going to, I don't know, let's say you were in Tech Elevator and you built your final capstone project and you want to go build it on your own and nothing's working, you can go and you can see, hey, what packages did they have installed? Uh, yeah, took more time than I'd like to realize I was supposed to look there for packages. Uh, don't ask how that happened. Um, so that's one of the first steps is to add packages that you need. And next you can add some of the things to the, uh, to the program file, the kind of root of the folder. So, and I really should label, label these better. Okay. And luckily though, I do have Copilot so I am going to, um, let's add a service. Yep, let's build our service, add controllers. That means I'm actually able to add my controllers so they will be part of the project. Um, let's builder.service. Explorer. So that's what will uh, give me that Swagger page so I can actually see all the APIs, the Swagger Explorer, and then this as well as part of that, followed by build. Okay. 
I just want to share how thrilled I am. <laughs> somebody is very thrilled. I'm just happy somebody's thrilled to see this presentation. <laughs> um, and then while I'm in here, I'll uh, do a couple other things as well. So I will use. So you should use HTTPS. It is a oops. it is a basic security thing. Um, and then also you should set up cores. I cannot tell you how many cores issues I have had. It seems like I have a cores issue every time I build an app. Um, so cores is a uh, it is a security thing saying what URLs are allowed to or what what's allowed to access this application. So if you're building locally, cores doesn't matter. You can just access it through your browser and postman. But when you want one app to call another app, let's say a front end app to call a back end app, you need to allow the headers, the origins, and the methods for that specific application. I'm just allowing any because this is a demo app and I don't believe in security. Um, <laughs> although I will turn on auth uh, authorization even though I won't use it. Yep, authorization. And then let's map to controllers. That should be enough to cover the basics. Let me make sure I got that right. Yeah, services dot did you add controllers? Yeah, okay. So that should be enough there. Um, now I'm going to start with making a really basic controller. You should put them in a controllers folder. I know, watching, oh wait, yeah, I can almost spell it, guys, I promise. <laughs> I said almost, not, yeah. I know how to make Copilot spell. <laughs> okay, let's make a books controller. <laughs> Bredger's not helping. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's put give a namespace, and let's just say it's the controller's namespace. Um, and so we're gonna give it a route so that says um, how you get to this uh, controller, and I'm just gonna use the controller name as the route which is pretty standard, um, although API slash that, nothing too weird there. Um, and then public class uh, book controller, they should be get, yeah. Um, though actually I will. I know it's brutal, I promise it gets better, maybe. Um, okay. Okay, let's get books. Oh. Need to add some using statements. The right one that I want. No, I want the NBC. Oh. Oh. oh, that's why I don't need the components. There we go. Okay, so it just took me five minutes to get to where Visual Studio got me in 30 seconds. Now let's see if it builds. Um, it will also not automatically open up uh, Swagger. I do need to get there myself if I can. Okay. And it's not working. Lovely. Did I put the wrong URL? No, nope, that's right, URL. Nope. Okay, should I just start cheating and copy from my other project that did work? <laughs> Here comes the fun part, debugging. <laughs> uh, 
Okay. If you, if you do a gift to, uh, to API slash books, those are giving back all books. So even if you can't get swagger, we can still test it, right? In front of the uh, API books. Oh, yeah, you're right. It does not. So, not Okay, so I'm now going to start cheating. Cheating? Uh, huh? Cheating as well. Yeah, so I'm going to copy over a program file from a pre built project that was the uh, same one as this and see if that fixes it. Oh, although I need to actually install Cosmos, I'm going to do that. So that's where this project's going to end up. That package. And the package name is Yeah, that's the one. Or actually no, it's so Okay. If it gets really bad, I will switch over to the test project just so you guys don't suffer for too long. Uh, when I've had issues with Swagger in the past, it's been a non matching uh, port in my uh, launch settings. Oh, that could be it. Um, Yeah, it's okay, that's what's going on here. Oh, yeah, that's a different port. It is HTTPS, not HTTPS. Well, but there should, yeah, the HTTPS one is there, so it should redirect to that. Does the IIS Express server have to be the same as the HTTP? No, I'm trying to remember. No, it shouldn't be an issue. Nope, okay. I'm just gonna switch to the other application that I already know works. This is why I bring it back up. Okay. Okay. Wow, I built that so fast. <laughs> it's like a cooking show. Yep. Okay. Okay. Wow, I built a get, post, and put all in seconds. That was, that was fast. <laughs> okay, so I'll walk you through what the application, uh, how it should have worked, and then we can maybe even see what went wrong with the first one. So the program file overall um, is where you're setting up configurations. So uh, a lot of those. So first, creating the build, you're going to use to build the application, and adding things like that, for example, any uh, configuration settings that you have. So this uh, application is using a connection string to Cosmos DB, um, and then also adding the various controllers, API endpoints, and swagger stuff to the application before it builds. Followed by you actually run the builder to build the app, and then, uh, I wonder if it was that, you swagger, you swagger, you like, that might have been it. Um, done as well as using HTTP redirect and, and the rest. The You also need a model to be able to actually uh, return a more complex type because you need to have some definition, some class to show what you're returning, then the controller itself. So the controller has so I'm doing a dependency injection in order to provide the database to it. So that is passing in the connection string from uh, the program.cs. Dependency injection is long enough topic and I'm just going to skip it and say there's probably some other presentation about it in the YouTube channel. Is there a dependency injection presentation in the YouTube channel? No. Somewhere. It's on the internet. Go, go find it. Um, and then what I'm doing is just one uh, query to get all books. 
So getting all objects that have a type book. Um, then one, uh, a post to create a new book. So we're passing in a name for a book and then uh, creating the book. And then a update where you pass in a, an ID for a specific book as well as the name you want to update the book to. So let's go and actually use this API and see what happens. So get all books. There are no books here. So when I do this, no, you get nothing. Let's add a book. Somebody name a book. Is there one on that podium next to you? Uh, <laughs> best practices. Okay. So you can see this is the URL that it used to make the query. So localhost. Um, uh, slash API slash books and then as a query parameter this could be passed in as an object or as a query parameter an object would be more traditional but I just did a query parameter for the sake of time so you pass in query parameters by saying the URL and then a question mark and then name of the query parameter followed by the actual value uh, in URLs they replace spaces with uh, percent symbol uh, 20s, which is why it looks so weird. So it's going to that URL, and then it gave me a 200 back saying, yes, you have added a book. We actually go and get books now. There is a book. The ID was generated on the server. <laughs> I know you're all curious. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I'll add a fun book, I don't know. Lord of the Rings, because you're all nerds. Whoa! <laughs> Technically not. Whoa! <laughs> you just swing that word nerds? <laughs> you're, you're out at 7.20 at a software development meetup. <laughs> I feel pretty confident. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fine, I'll replace it with a more fun book. Uh, or less nerdy book. So, and then for the put, I would actually have to put in the ID for a given book, to find that book, that's unique ID, um, and then a new name for the book, um, let's say, I don't know, mostly harmless. Catching a Fire. <laughs> oh, you can do Mostly Harmless. Thank you. And that successfully updated it, turned to 200, and now I have two books. ASP.NET uh, 8 best practices and mostly harmless. If I tried to update a book with an ID that doesn't exist, it would return some type of a 4 or 500. It should probably be a 400, maybe a 4 or 4 not found. Um, but this is a demo project, so you get what you get. Any questions? It actually gave you a 500 back that put a 4 or a 4 or inside of it. Oh, did it? Good. He's admitting this accurate. Yeah. I'm going to pretend that was on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I didn't see it. So in your post where you make a new book, what's in the body of the post? Does that mean you put all the stuff in the query parameter? Yep, so the query parameter is just the name of the book, and then everything else is actually generated on the back end. Because, so I'm doing a document database. If you Are people familiar with document versus SQL databases? I'm seeing some nods and a lot of not nods. Okay, so a SQL database is very clearly typed where you have the book table that has these columns. A document database, you can throw any JSON in and you're fine. So if you just said return all, it would give you the books, the authors, the comments, the responses, every single type of JSON in there, maybe a PowerPoint slide, whatever. Um, that's not a joke, you can actually put PowerPoints in document databases. Um, instead, what I'm doing, which is a common-ish practices I have a thing called type. And if I'm inserting a book, it's going to have type book. I don't trust the front end people, I say as somebody who develops in the front end, um, to consistently pass in the right type. So what I'm doing is, uh, when I get that name, I am then setting the type to book. You don't get a choice. The type is book, the back end controls, that's a database thing. 
um, as well as setting the new ID. So I'm only passing in one field, the other two fields are generated on the back end to match the controller. If I was passing in an author, the back end would know, oh, you're in the author's controller, you're passing in an author, I will then give it type author. I, I do feel obligated to point out that anything you put in that URL in the query string is publicly visible to anything, even if you're using HPS. So yes. if you're putting in something super secure, it should be that's in not a good place for yes. you to put it. Yep. Yeah, no, normally a post would use a body. This was just the fast example. How do you change the query string of the name to a common type of surface body? Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. You can say no. Huh? <laughs> it's not that hard. Okay. You shouldn't be using query. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, can I just do this? Uh, Remember correctly, when you just add a complex type there, it will then treat it. So if you have a simple type like a string, we'll keep this query parameter for your complex type, it will then uh, treat it as a overall, um, as a body of the type. No, it'll generate a good on its own. As long as you have a, yeah. So it, the difference here is going to be when I pass in book now, um, I could fill all three fields, but two of them are optional. The two that have a default value are optional. So a thing that you'd actually do for a more complex application is you would pass in an object that is partially complete. Like it would be like a book request object, and it has name and author, and then it runs through a validator, and then you generate the type you saw in the database, which would be like actual book or full book, something that then contains the ID, the type, and the like that are generated on the back end. But for now, this is good enough, so... So, or I thought that was the right way to do it. No, let's pass them all in square parameters. Shoot, let me try to remember how to do a body. It can be explicit to say from body. Is oh, yeah, there. yes. That should have been the default behavior. There might be something configured differently about this, but by default, that should Usually, it's the same from the uh, So, before the word book, I have square brackets from body, and then it's a definite name. Yeah, I will say when you set things up entirely from scratch on your own, you do learn more, you also have more. Oh, that one little piece was missing, and everything's broken. Probably. In fact, I would, I would bet money that that's probably where it is. Okay. So now it has no parameters, it just has a body. Um, because ID and type are optional, I can put in just name. Um, not being another book. I can almost spell. Okay. Um, but then I could also actually now that because I set it up poorly, I can put in my own IDs. One, two, three, type. I'll actually keep type book because the query won't work otherwise. I think I did a camel case. I don't Sorry, actually remember. Yeah, it's lowercase. Um, okay, and execute. So now if I get all books, I get a variety of data. 
Okay. More questions. Mark, you can ask questions again. I just wanted to get through this first. Anything else about this, about the overall presentation? Anything else about REST? I you scroll up a little bit, I want to see what you put in there. Okay. Yeah. Well, this one didn't have any query parameters. If I wanted to, I could do like uh, something like names. Yeah. So this is a request body. Um, C sharp only cares about the parts of the body that match what it's taking. So I could do things like um, yeah. Five. Is this on the type? Uh, no, they're not on the type, so they're going to get totally ignored. Um, because if as you can have extra things in the body that are not supposed to be there, those will get ignored. And anything left off the body is treated as. It's not null because it's almost like an undefined. It's not technically undefined in C sharp. Well, it's the default value, so it's yeah. Fine. So this worked, and now if you look at this, you when we look at the book, it only has the values that are actually part defined as part of book. Um, the other values are all dropped and ignored. There is a fun API I'm currently working on, which is we'll just chuck stuff at it. I mean. We're doing it through a multi-layer step going through GraphQL, and GraphQL needs more things in the body um, to query properly than C Sharp in this instance. And instead of editing the body and carefully trimming everything, we just pass the whole body on through, and C Sharp ignores everything we don't want to have, which is very nice. Seems like that should return a bad request. Nope. You cannot pass in anything you want that's extra as long as you have the required parameters. If I want to have a bad request, all I need to do is... Um, actually, no, I guess you can pass them without name as well, because I guess, oh yeah, because it's a string, so it is, uh, What's the partition attribute? Empty by default. Um, ID. But the ID has a default value, so even if you pass in this empty, it wouldn't fail. But this is why we get a lot of uh, serialization issues if we have a spelling or casing issue, it just, it silently fails to map it, right? Yeah. So you can pass in names as null, apparently. This name is the noble, noble value. So well, you should do things like marking your uh, uh, marking things as required to prevent that, or even have, a, um, a, like I said, a first object and then a second layer with uh, business logic, so kind of a domain model, which actually takes that request object in and builds it into your fully fleshed object and validates each field to say, like, I don't know, are cities in the correct casing? Um, does it have all the required parameters? Is this date before that date? Those things would happen in the main model, a step after this. They can also happen actually in the constructor um, for the object that you're passing in, although that can be a little more complicated to pull off sometimes. There's a really nice library called Fluent validation, which can do this implicitly <coughs> in the actual ASP.NET middleware. Yeah. Um, and it'll actually shoot back uh, the correct uh, status code. Mm -hmm. you, can, you, can, you can also write custom validators. Yes. Badass. Yeah, I've done, I'm not sure actually what the custom validators have written, what extensions they were using, if any. And I know actually, uh, Golang is also has really solid middleware support because you can actually build out the full middleware customly. Where .NET, a lot of middleware is kind of abstract behind the scenes, which on one hand makes a lot of this a lot easier, but on the other hand gives you a little bit less control. But honestly, sometimes control is just another way for you to mess things up. So <laughs> it's nice to have some things taken care of for you. Okay, anything else? Um, then, let's 
Oh, let's see. I'm doing name, not title. So, okay. Copilot's amazing. Yes. Um, so, it is now selecting from C where type is book and name is that. Um, that's a weird way of concatenating it. Uh, you should not do this in real life because SQL injection is a big security risk, but this is a demo. So, please don't see. Yep. Could you still technically just pass the book object on there? Um, no, so this is going to come in as a query parameter from the URL. Um, you could try to pass in the, an object, except dot net will not allow you to pass in bodies at all for get requests. So everything coming in with the uh, get command is a query parameter, which is why once in a while a really complex get command ends up being a post. Is that, is that potentially more performative though, in the instances where the object uh, properly gets easily accessible than parsing whatever which is Um, I'm not, I don't think there's a big difference in performance, but there might be a big difference in maintainability or understandability. So like not necessarily the code run faster, but the human would understand it and write it better and maintain it better. Definitely there can be a big difference there. Um, but I think this might have actually just been written correctly from the start, so let's find out. Yeah, I mean the way that I'd do this if I was actually doing it would probably be something like uh, well, now I'm blanking on the name for the library that does uh, dot where, no. yeah, using link or using one of the SQL libraries that lets you add parameters explicitly that then have validation prevent a SQL injection. If you guys are not familiar with SQL injection, it is one of the most common ways of hacking things. It is also very easy to do, and now people have scripts that do it automatically. So you don't want to leave yourself open to that. Um, and I just realized I made it so I had to search the name exactly. So I'm going to cheat. And we'll find mostly harmless. So it got that one book. Probably should not have returned to this in array since we're searching for single books. Um, but could have done a similar thing for ID. Oh. Yes, I could. <laughs> I'm also not good at SQL injection. So the way SQL injection works is you add in something like a comment to end the SQL query, and then you add your own query. Like I would do, uh, how do you make a comment in SQL? It's what? Dash dash? Like dash dash, something like I do maybe like, yeah, I do end and then drop table. So end previous query, now drop the table. And that's how you do a SQL injection. This will not work, probably. Let's find out. Cosmos DB doesn't work. Didn't do anything. Yeah, no, Cosmos is actually really hard to delete things. I was planning on having it delete in the demo, and it, I it was preparing uh, for a, a deployment today, and I did not have enough time to actually get my delete working <laughs> because you have to do it based on the petition key and the value. It's more complicated to uh, delete Cosmos. Okay, other questions? Sweet, then I hope you all enjoyed it. That was awesome. Happy to. Uh, here is our video. All right, so we got a couple of raffles to do here. Uh, the way I want to do this tonight is I'll, I'll, I'll just say, hey, who, who's our first winner? And then what do you want? You want a book or you want a license, right? And then we'll do our second one and, and the like. Uh, let's see. Fuzzy Bunny. One more round of applause. Yes, that's very nice. Now stick around for a while.